My name is Eric Atria, and you're watching Musicians on Bicycles Getting Popsicles. My guest today is Michael check Clater. One, two, one, two. Check one. I've known Michael for many years, and I've watched him develop into an excellent songwriter. I'd say that Michael is the heart of the Gainesville music community. Very few people are as genuinely in love with playing music as Michael is. He sings and writes truly from the heart, and his songs are always excellent. Despite knowing him for all these years, I really didn't know his story. I didn't know why he does what he does. So we got together, rode some bicycles, and ate some popsicles. I hope you enjoy. So we know the best track history of riding bikes together. <laughs> That's true. Last Today, time we got poured on. Yes. So what was the first musical instrument you owned? The first musical instrument I owned myself was a drum set. Nice. Yeah. Well, well a snare drum first and then a drum set. Okay. So it was just like a school band. Yeah. When was that? I got the drum set when I was in sixth grade. From there, I played just drums for a long time. From sixth grade till probably 11th grade. And then, but then I started picking up the guitar. So who was your guy? Or like guys, like band-wise, musician-wise? Who, who was your idol then? When I started playing drums, I was really into punk rock music. Like, and I was a big skateboarder, you know, so I was listening to like MXPX and uh, Mill and Colin and those bands. When did you start writing songs? As soon as I started playing guitar, that's all I, that was like my whole intent. What was your, your blueprint for how to do that? For whatever reason, I've always drifted toward the finger style guitar. So when I first picked up the guitar, I just wanted to finger pick all day. I didn't really learn that many songs when I was first starting out. I was just wanting to write. It's a good way to start your own unique style, not yeah. copying anybody. When did you first start playing publicly? Were you, were you, was there like a, any high school like talent nights or anything like that? Oh or? yeah, that was all we played. <laughs> there was like a high school, it wasn't a battle of the bands because it wasn't a contest, but, and we play that every year. And that was about the only show we played. It was fun too, it was really fun. We'd have like, everybody from our high school would turn out. That was our bread and butter. We played like once a year. So that was <laughs> so it, that was easy. Come out. Yep. I mean, like, we know that you aren't sick of us yet. What kind of songs are you writing here? Sort of alternative, a little folkier, just because of the finger picking, you know? And I'm sure a lot of those songs to listen back to are super embarrassing. Did you go through the writing songs for, you know, really stupid, sappy songs for girls phase? I mean, yeah. Okay. Yep. Because I'm, I'm wondering, based on what you've been saying so far, it seems like you may have avoided that because you kind of had a different path than most people. I don't think you can avoid it. I don't think it's avoidable. That's a good it? point. I still do that sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but they usually die in your songs now. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Everyone dies in the songs now. Who was your favorite band? Edwin McCain. Remember that guy? He sang that song, I'll Be Your Crying Shoulder. Okay. Yep. I listened to him a lot. So when you came to college, were you looking to start a band or were you just looking to play yourself? I was definitely looking to play music. Yeah, that was, that was it. I mean, I didn't know what I was going to study, but I was going to be a musician. <laughs> when you first came to town, where were you looking to try to play out? The first solo show I played in Gainesville was at the Bagel Bakery <laughs> on uh, 16th Avenue and like 43rd. 43rd yeah. Yep, the Bagel Bakery. So it was after hours, they like moved some tables out of the way and it was me and a couple other people playing. <laughs> so it was an after hours show at a bagel place. Now after hours for a bagel place is like what? Uh, I don't know. At I night? guess they serve decaf. In the afternoon? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was at night. It was probably like six or seven. It was like an evening affair. I think they still had like bagels and muffins and stuff available for people who came. So what was the crowd like? Uh, seated <laughs> and uh, very respectful. <laughs> <laughs> I think I also covered uh, Don't Stop Believing that night. Ironically or non-ironically? It's somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the middle, I think. <laughs> That's one of those gigs to me that sounds like now you look back and you're like, oh my god, I played the Bagel Baker. But at the time you were probably pretty pleased to be playing a show. Man, I was really excited and really nervous. <sighs> Did you already know the guys that would become a Moja at this point? Yep. And, and were they already they a band? Show. We were already a band at that point. Okay, actually. so you were already in a Mojo Orchestra. Yeah. That band was obviously hugely successful. What was that, the similar thing, whereas at first a lot of people came out because they were friends, or did, was there a slow build for that? Or? Um, 
I'm trying to think. We played a couple. Uh, we played the Hispanic Heritage Month talent show. It's a good I one. I think that was our first show, and we had uh, one Colombian in the band, and the rest of us were like all white kids. <laughs> a lot of them Jewish too. And I think we got runner-up, <laughs> which was the <laughs> saddest part. <laughs> and this is like when you first get to college, you know, you make a million friends, and right. then none of them stick. But right. So we had like a million friends and everybody came out. <laughs> yeah, you're like, oh, you like Ultimate Frisbee too? Yeah. And then you realize that it's not that special. Yeah. <laughs> like, Man, we're best friends. I can't believe it. Oh, sorry. Didn't even see that guy coming. If you're going to ride up on somebody, give him a little heads up. Just say, <laughs> say on your left. It's the bike tip of the day. So when did the Flacos thing come up? Uh, I think it was 2007. Do you have any explanation for why that caught on? I think it was, it had to do with the size of the room and everybody shouting everything. There were like lots of inside jokes from like the very beginning. It kind of felt like a community right off the bat. Do you remember how long it took for there to start being a little bit of a crowd? I remember having a couple of nights like in, in the first two months that were really big and then it kind of never slowed down. Yeah, it never did. Like there was never really an off night for that. Yeah. The first couple weeks were a little sad, but <laughs> after that it picked up and it was, it was good till the end. But I, I mean, I feel like it was pretty obvious that something was happening there. I mean, did you feel that way? Yeah, I mean, we loved it. It was, it was the best night of the week. Yeah. We'd get there super early and hang out and eat flacos and then all of our friends would show up. It was really fun. I know a lot of people, myself included, would alter their Thursday mornings so they could go. Yeah, me too. I would pick my classes <laughs> so that I didn't have to be in class on Thursday mornings. And this was for no money? No money. No money exchanged hands. Besides the Flacos, what's like one of the high points? Like the Dixieland Jazz Band I used to play with. <laughs> That's right. Uh, opened for Joe Biden's yeah. speech. That's pretty big. <laughs> And our payment for that gig was just getting to meet Joe Biden, <laughs> which was a really, really strange experience. But that was pretty cool. Uh, a lady found us on the street corner one night. We were just set up on a street corner playing. And she was like, uh, I have a gig for you guys, but I can't tell you what it is. And I need all of your names. <laughs> and we were like, okay, sure. <laughs> and so uh, I think we had... She, she was doing like background checks right. and um, at a certain point during the next 24 hours before the gig, uh, all of us dropped calls on our phones. So I think we were being like... <laughs> you mean somebody called and did, hung up? No, like we'd be on the phone with uh -huh. somebody and it would just cut off. Oh, weird. Which, you know, that doesn't really happen that much. No. And all of us had had it happen, so we figured we were probably... Our phones had been tapped and... <sighs> All this stuff, and that was like before we even figured out what this gig was. That's crazy. <laughs> she called us the next day. What's the one, like maybe you had a close brush with what you perceived to be making it or some bigger level of success? We played this house show in Nashville, and the guy whose house it was was like a, a recording engineer for a big studio there. And at the time, he was working on uh, Kings of Leon's new record. Yeah which turned out to be huge, you know? Right. Um, and when our lead singer broke a string, I filled in while he changed his string and played a couple songs, you know? Just like two or three songs. But the guy whose house it was really loved my music and was trying to get me to come back up and, and uh, record an album with him. But I had, uh, this was like maybe a year after I just put out the first album. I didn't have any songs really. Uh. <laughs> And so it kind of fizzled because he'd, uh, he'd send me an email and be like, how are those songs coming? I'd be like, mm, I'm trying. I, you know, I'm the kind of guy who can't force it exactly. Right. What is this for you at this point in life? Right now, it's sort of like a, a career in a different way since I'm working with the arts and medicine program, which is really cool. And I never thought that, I, that it would be a possibility to just to be able to do music for a living and not have to be on the road all the time. Yeah. So I don't know. I think I'm just going to keep following it and keep playing as much as I can and writing and recording and whatever. But I want to do a, an EP of gunfighter ballads. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> and one day I want to write a musical and perform it. I love how 
Gainesville has all these churches that are just like cinder block squares. I don't know yeah. if I can turn this and get it. There we go. So what is it about staying in this town or doing music in this town? First of all, I just think Gainesville is like a really great town with a lot of really great people doing cool stuff. You know, when you put so much into living somewhere, and at this point I think I've been here for like eight or nine years, where it's hard to move because you have friends in a community yeah. and it's kind of like if you go somewhere you're starting from scratch and Gainesville is a good place to be anyway, so it doesn't really seem worth it to, <laughs> to yeah, leave. There's a really nice energy about Gainesville. Yeah, it's not a bad place. I have a picture of you standing in the pines, pines, pines. I have a picture of you standing in the pines. Oh, yes, I keep it clean with pints of turpentine, time, time. Yes, I keep it clean with pints of turpentine. Ooh. Carrot chia. That doesn't sound so good. Carrots are pretty sweet. It can be. Blueberry cinnamon sounds good, and bourbon peach. Not this early in the morning. <laughs> I think it's pretty clear to me that I'm going to do blueberry lavender lemonade. That sounds very refreshing. It does, doesn't it? But I have had the cucumber lemon mint, and that's pretty delicious as well. I think I'm going to do the guava hibiscus. That's what I'm going to get.